Well, it's kind of stone at that point. Yeah, yeah it's not even wood anymore. Uh, the the fossilized remains of the wood, let's say. An entire forest is basically buried under the mud and petrified. And that's a, that's the stratum upon which everything is built. And it's still there. Beep boop, intro music. Welcome to the Cypher Sci-Fi, we explore how and why. That is, comma, where we take a piece of popular media, movie, TV, sci-fi something or other, and learn a bunch of cool things that you didn't know you needed to know. Like, what do we got this week? Export controls. That's what we're on about today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Holography. Bananas. The forest under Venice. Smart glasses and Amazon having all the microphones in your house. I'm Christopher Peterson. I'm Lee Colbert. We watched a movie. Colbert. What do we watch? Spider-Man. Far from home. Is this... This is the reason one. Was this from the whole uh, Thanos endgame phase of the MCU? Or are we in the new one now with this? We're in phase three, about to go into phase four, I believe. Oh, so this is part of the old one. Before we get into the new business. Cool. Hey, spoiler alert, we're going to spoil the movie. Colbert, what is Spider-Man Far From Home about? It is about Peter Parker going on a school trip, visiting various different countries with his multi-stage plan to tell MJ how he feels. And then Fate and Nick Fury get in the way. Yeah, and there's really dumb monsters. Elemental monsters. Also, what's his face? And Jake Gyllenhaal's there with a bubble on his head. It's he's, Mysterio. He's very charming. And it's a fishbowl, okay? Or a 50s space helmet. And hijinks and Sue. Hijinks or shenanigans. After all the events of the MCU, this is the first movie that's taking place after everyone comes back from the snap and Thanos gets off. And in the wake of that, Spider-Man's going on a school trip. Well, Chris, as we all know, and as espoused in the movie, you should put a VPN on your phone so the government can't track you when you're abroad. A VPN such as NordVPN, <laughs> <laughs> which, you know, just kidding. I'm getting so used to hearing those ads on both podcasts and especially on YouTube. For a very reasonable price. Did you see Tom Scott's recent video on this phenomenon? VPN or? VPN advertising in particular. No. It was great. In that deluge of VPN products being advertised on a lot of YouTube channels and even podcasts, NordVPN being the one I can most remember hearing, they use kind of iffy language that technically seems to suggest things that you might not want to take away from how things actually work. Makes it feel a little more, makes it feel a little more urgent and a little more scary, so that you'll buy the product. Like that's sure. how you sell things. Instead of being like, "This is our level of encryption, and this is where endpoint is," with a with no data extradition policy. Yeah, and here's our here's our logging policies, and here's how we deal with governments. So instead, they'll say things like military grade encryption, what, what which is entirely unspecial, but makes it sound fancy. Or they'll talk about the way that your web traffic is exposed to viewing by malicious hackers in a way that it. Oh, it's like that pop-up. You are broadcasting an IP address. Yes, yes. <laughs> in a way that it generally isn't available, actually, because very nearly all of your traffic goes over HTTPS these days. That sort of thing. Anyway, so Tom Tom Scott, I'll put this in the show notes, made a video uh, about his work trying to get an advertiser to sponsor one of his videos where he took down that sort of sensationalist misleading verbiage. And tried to talk about how a VPN actually works and how the way these other people were advertising was a little bit misleading. And he ultimately couldn't come to an agreement with the one person, the one firm that was going to sponsor. So the video was entirely unsponsored. And that sucks. But yeah, it was it was good. He just takes down that whole thing with a level of technical with a technical level that was, I think, generally approachable for someone on the internet, you know? Because that mm. would be the difficulty is like like I run an open VPN server. How much does it have military grade encryption, Chris? It has military grade encryption. You know what? Actually, it's as nonsensical as that is, as it just means it's an NSA approved encryption scheme. It doesn't mean current best practices, which the NSA actually releases current best practices for securing systems, which is very handy if you want to go through it. They are incredibly thorough documents about securing servers. But saying that without any qualifiers, you're just saying it's the thing everything uses because that's what everything uses. There was a time back in the day when like these things were treated as arms exports and there were restrictions, but we don't have that anymore. 
This isn't not, this is very little to do with Spider Man because I don't think he ever uses VPN. Uh, he has all Stark Tech. That's probably got its own. It's probably tunnel somewhere. Communications network. Yeah, <laughs> he's actually using his own his entire his entire connection to the satellite network as a private network. So you know what? Do use a VPN when you're traveling abroad or whatever. Also use it at home. I don't know. It's the thing is, it's funny is that they're going to Europe, which actually has privacy laws. She's talking about get a VPN, presumably with the outlet in the United States where all the monitoring is happening. This government is doing more of the tracking than any other, probably, outside of China and the like. And now that we got the classic uh, Decipher Sci-Fi shtick out of the way of just grabbing onto a very minuscule part of the – just something that was said in passing. That's the entire show. It's always the entire show. <laughs> what Moving on. Learned, Chris? But having – Having gotten advice that he should have a VPN, and it's good advice, and having had his banana taken away, our hero winds up in Venice, the first leg of his trip, which was a cool setting for their first, like, monster battle and a bunch of stuff, because it's a, a scenic city, half underwater. Was it Canelli, Chris? Canelli. Where was Schiaparelli from, do you think? And I have to wonder, why is Venice underwater? Like, did they build it in the water? Or was it not water yet, and they built it, and they were like, oh, shit, well, it now wasn't, it's all in the water. It wasn't ice in the not quite water yet, but they built it on or in a lagoon. And hey, guess what uh, you're going to be building on a lagoon? Not bedrock. So you pretty much like have to put sink your foundation so you hit clay. And the thing is, a lot of that ground still compacts. So you wind up with uh, a lot of your buildings just sinking. And this is like what are we we're talking about hundreds of years. It had a pretty good run, even if it sunk right now. Like, good for you. You you dug out. You built your city on a swamp that lasted since like 500 AD. What I had no idea, and I was interested to see, was how did they do this? Like you're saying, there's no bedrock under there. The best you're going to hit is clay instead of just mud. Like that's an upgrade over mud, but it's still not great. Works well enough, apparently. Well, it works well enough if they basically took millions of trees and stuck them in the ground. That's where they came from. I mean, let's <laughs> put, put you back where you belong. They basically took an entire forest off the mainland and dunked it into the mud on that spot so they could build on it. That's crazy, especially 500 AD, like consider the period. They have about 10 feet of mud that they stuck these trees into, basically just tree trunks. Uh, straight up and down until they hit the clay, and that was a building surface. And you would think that was a bad idea, because wood will just, like, rot eventually. It's been hundreds of years. Why is it even still there? It is still there. It doesn't rot because it's in the mud, which is a low-oxygen environment, and there's the ocean water right there creating a highly saline thing. It winds up petrifying over the course of hundreds of years, and it's been that long. So the wood is still there. Well, it's kind of stone at that point. Yeah, yeah, it's not even wood anymore. Uh, the the fossilized remains of the wood, let's say. An entire forest is basically buried under the mud and petrified. And that's a, that's the stratum upon which everything is built. And it's still there. Like, some of that shit is still there from then. Although, maybe not for too much longer. Unfortunately. As, well, as it sinks, which it seems to be doing one to two millimeters per year. But how do we know it's sinking? Like, how do you measure that? Well, you have the observation, like, oh, the water came up to here. And <laughs> now, now it's, it's up, up to here. here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure something changed. That could be. But I think um, it's not too dissimilar to how we measure volcanoes. What do you mean? How we do measurements with volcanoes. Oh, you mean how, like, we measure, like, that is bulging. We're starting to get worried about the volcano mm -hmm. type measure. I didn't think of that. So, like, space-based radar and GPS business. It's another topographical feature that you want to map. Isn't the technology amazing? Isn't that fun? Those people felt the water coming up, and they measured that it was higher than it was. But then we can also be like, here's exactly how much higher it was, versus sea level rising, no less. Also, apparently, like things compact over time. You think after like 1,500 years of passing, it might have been done. But uh, they have the modern population has drained the groundwater. Well, if it's fresh, it would be something to drink. I'm not sure if it was. That's why I couldn't see the detail. I didn't find the details. Um but apparently, the modern population has drained a lot of groundwater out of the area, and suddenly, like, whoops, we're sinking even more. I think there are some projections that by 2100, it will be underwater. Good job, Venice. Also, good job, good job, rest of Earth, for raising the sea level pretty rapidly. 
So the city's sinking and the sea level's rising. It's a bad combination. And you've seen, like every year, more or less, they have a flood season. And every year you see, like, oh, look, Venice is flooding again. And people are walking around in giant boots up to their knees. The the sewage is backing up out of everybody's toilets. What a shitty situation to be in. Like, this is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So it seems pretty for sure that we're ri- that we're raising the sea level with majorly our contributions of carbon to the atmosphere, but whatever else. Uh, and Venice is going to be out of luck pretty soon. Like, it's already getting bad. It's sinking. and sea level's rising. What do we do? They had the bright idea some years ago now to build a seawall. Not a permanent seawall, but a we can turn it on and turn it off seawall. An- the idea being enough to catch a couple meters of of uh, of flood without dumping it into the city. They called it the Mosaic Project. It's called. It's still the work. The thing is, after years and years of working on this, it was supposed to be done a couple of years ago, and then the next date was it supposed to be done by like this month, and now the date is 2022. Maybe kind of. Yeah, that slipping is not a good sign. The slipping is not a good sign. Everything about this is not a good sign. It seems like there's like a lot of corruption and scandals, and I mean, there's not a lot of holding it off. I mean, it's not as bad as the Maldives, which, I mean, their highest point is like six or seven feet above sea level. The lowest, so. highest elevation in the world for a funny <laughs> yeah, sentence. Yeah, the flattest with the lowest, highest elevation. And they're super screwed. Uh, yeah, they're looking like 20, 30. That might be kind of no more. Yeah, and there's no building a seawall around all those islands in the middle of the ocean. So they need to uh, kind of hammer some of that corruption. It, it's It's looking pretty bad. And it's incredibly expensive, incredibly expensive billions of dollars, and it's going to take billions of maintenance. And there's the possibility that the if if the Mose project worked, if it could even function correctly, because they haven't completed it, and who knows if it ever would be complete, there's the concern that as sea level rises, things get worse for Venice. Those could be up effectively all the time, thus completely changing the ecology of the What's the body of water they're in? The Venetian Lagoon. In the Venetian Lagoon. Thank you, Colbert. Which is pretty shitty and bad, and it'll make everything worse and terrible. Like, how much... I guess we're going to have to start thinking about this a lot as time goes on. This is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's a big, important piece of human history and culture, and it's a major business. It's a place of major business for tourism. But how much money is it reasonable to spend for a place Period. Because we have, we have so many coastal cities that are sure they're important, and they're going to be underwater. I think it's apparent now, because we're not slowing anything down. Not nearly as fast as it should be. What price tag do you put on Venice? We're actually seeing a backslide. What do you mean? Like the the rate of growth or the rate of slowing down of uh, has actually slowed itself. <laughs> the rate of slowing down slowed down. Yeah. So that's better, right? Double slowdown. Well, as you say, the the <laughs> The rate of decrease has slowed down. Yeah. It's not getting better as fast as we want it to, and not as well as it was. And not as well as it needs to. Man, that sucks. What do we do with places like this? What does the world, what does humanity do? You either build seawalls and accept that this is now an enclosed city. In a in an algae-covered swamp, because it's <laughs> no longer connected to the ocean. Or, I get, or you give up on it, and you find a, a way to move everyone. Or transplant buildings, like move buildings. And there are there there were like dozens of propositions for what they were going to do. Ven- the Venice put out a call for engineering uh, engineering ideas of what do we do to stop the city from being flooded, as we have both sinking and uh, ocean level rise. And ultimately, this was a system that was approved over a bunch of others. One of the other options that was also crazy, but since it's <laughs> since we're in in crazy town already, it was legit to lift the entire city. Like, pick it up and fill it. Pick it up bit by bit and fill it with silt. And I presume, you know, harder stuff as well. Is that what we're resorting to? Like, that's 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 crazy. That sounds very expensive. So does the seawall. Billions of dollars. And it might not ever, might not ever be completed. It might not ever work. And if it does, it might also ruin everything because I, it'll be on all the time. In my mind, for some reason, like, we can make artificial islands. That's a no-one procedure. I mean, Dubai goes crazy with that. Yeah. Just continue making... Steal in the world's hand to make their islands. Yeah. (laughs) So that's a figured out process. It's just lifting a building, doing that, and then putting it back. Ultimately, none of these things are actually the answer. The answer was like, go back in a time machine and stop ruining everything decades ago. But barring that, 
we're going to be looking at this question more and more, I'm sure. Like, how much is this worth to humanity? And humanity has not, and humanity in general may not have a say because it's it's the territory of a particular nation state. So then, like, what does Italy care about Venice in the end? This sucks. That's it. There's no uh, there's no silver lining silver lining there at all. Especially if you're going to have scary elemental monsters jamming up the place and knocking everything over. Well, if they destroy all the important buildings, well, problem solved. <laughs> then we have nothing to save. Yeah. Oh, we're off the hook. It's a bunch of rubble. No one cares about rubble. The the plot as it's laid out early in the movie, when there's a, a giant water monster attacking Venice, is that there are elemental monsters, which is already like the MCU in general. It has some magical business like we touched on with Thor last week. But like generally we're talking science. There's a, there's a, a rational scientific world justification for the things that happen. Even in the case of the magic, they're like, well, you know, dimensions or whatever, blah, blah, blah. They're trying. And then we get to this movie. And in the beginning, it's like there's elemental monsters. They were formed in the gravity between some black holes. And now they're here to rake fire and water and earth damage to you. And it was so dissatisfying to have such a dumb magic, really like poorly explained thing. But thank God, it turned out it was all a trick. And I was so relieved. And this actually is a science movie. We're not dealing with elemental monsters from a black hole. We're dealing with Jake Gyllenhaal being Trixie. Being Trixie Hobbes. Using drones with holography and simulated damage. Well, no, real damage being simulated to real effect. I'm not sure how to put it. Yeah, that's real simulated damage. I didn't realize. I, I figured he was the bad guy. I didn't know it was going to go this way. I was like, well, Jake Gyllenhaal is just a cool bro. And he's fighting some monsters. <laughs> I thought Mysterio's a bad guy, but he's a bro. A Dude, I don't care. They can make a good guy, bad guy in the movie. What, who am I? I don't know anything. They're like, here's the fire elemental, but don't let him touch metal, because if he touches metal, he can draw power from the Earth's core. Well, no, he gets bigger. And if he gets big enough, then he can draw power from the Earth's core. Okay. And it's game over. Both of those things are so stupid. I was so mad. I was thinking, like, we're not going to be able to cover this movie if this is what it's about. It's like, what do you say? And it turns out it was all bull what a relief it was a trick in the movie the guy even like when jake gyllenhaal mysterio gets it over on everybody he's like it was such a stupid story they didn't even ask they just followed it and his whole thing jake gyllenhaal's whole bad guy team they're disgruntled stark industries employees but this whole thing is just a giant vfx project that's incredible it was so clever i went from being upset that we were going to be able to talk about this movie in the show to being really excited about the things they were doing it was really cool the entire project is like volumetric projection trickery. We've talked about tr- volumetric projections before in different contexts. There have been a few movies that have used it a lot, and we've got some mileage out of it, but I've never thought of it this way before. And this is the first time I've seen it be drones. Well, they're the mobile projectors, so that you have essentially a boundless like holodeck. A boundless holodeck. Yeah. I like that. They don't go into what the technology is. No. So that Tony Stark dismissively uh, uh, called it barf. The real life things we have that are even a little bit in the direction, like we do not have, we do not have satisfying volumetric projection yet, especially not f- like free floating. Well, especially ones that you can't you can't see through. Yes, they're all the best we can do is not great, and it's still a floaty thing. Like you would not be confusing it for real life at all. But what about by drone? I thought that was so clever. Maybe not the magic ones in the movie, but just the increased miniaturization. Like, if you, you've seen, we've talked about before, the light shows by drone. They're equivalent of, like, a fireworks show. Mm-hmm. Intel did the very impressive one. China, for some reason, somewhere in China, pulled off a really large one as well. That was a really uh, impressive technical accomplishment. Which we've also talked about drone swarms. Yeah. And their advancements. Not to mention, it fits with, we need it not to just be... A pretty thing you see, but to have real world effects. Hey, look, these things have a bunch of weapons on them. And they can they can blow stuff up. Yes. Yeah, so the things that are flowing around, providing the image that we're seeing, which is the monster that was not real, were affecting the environment through, I guess, bullets. Which you think someone would find the bullets? That's why I was just I was assuming it can't be bullets. It's got to be some kind of fancy Stark technology. Sure, look like it bullets. has concussion blasts and all the other things. But yeah, and the other thing was just like blasts of sound waves as a general push. But that's the whole thing. You you just you can run with Stark Tech. He was able to build anything and everything. So the drones 
theoretically can do anything that you need. Shoot lightning? Sure, it's got a lightning gun on it. Flamethrower. Sure, it's got a flamethrower. Uh, <laughs> Whatever. Machine gun that doesn't like leave bullets behind. And they're cloaking. And they can outfit themselves with the, the projector. They can fall from space and also return to and return back to space with no problem at all. There's a, like, as much as I was unsatisfied with these elemental monsters are dumb, it's magic, it doesn't make any sense. I'm totally cool with all this stuff with the drones and all the Stark tech. That was the whole thing about Stark tech is the exponential growth of his he, look, nanotechnology, which is like, look at my suit. Yeah, once you get to the nanotech, like, you can pretty much pull anything off, can't you? And he did, pretty much anything. The deal with the drones is that they are projecting these monster attacks. They're even projecting Mysterio's fighting of the monsters. Like, the whole thing was choreographed and, like, pre-rendered, perhaps, just to be shown for the benefit of S.H.I.E.L.D. and the world so he could, like, get control of Tony's business, right? To sell the world on him being a hero. Dot, dot, dot. Dot, dot, dot. Profit. So I have a question for you, Chris. How do they handle all the art assets and the teams to mock all this up? If I know. It's got to be all <laughs> super realistic. I have. You think it's good enough to go out there with a super high def camera and there's like what? Stark AI to figure it all out? You've seen real time Unreal Engine demos that were photorealistic. Yeah, like but not recently, displayed right? in the real world to the point where I'm like, is that real? Oh, well, I mean, w- we have incredible real time ability at this point. They tend, like, human characters still. Human characters and cloth and things and hair tend not to be still picture perfect on these real time things. But like, dude, like we just talked a couple of weeks ago about the projection mapping LED walls. Although we didn't me- we didn't mention the mapping thing in that context, where we have we've gone from shooting people on green screens to it being reasonable and cost justifiable. Maybe not cost effective, but cost justifiable to project real time rendered background on a screen an LED wall behind the actors so that they actually are in a place with the lighting that should be there more or less and able to react to things that are sort of around them more than they would be when you're making like episode one on a green screen and everybody's horrible. We didn't mention though would be the projection mapping angle. This is the way you can make a lot of this stuff work is if you only have one person looking at it. And in the case of these movies, like in the Mandalorian, it's the camera is the one person. If you have one person looking at it, you can make a flat surface look like whatever you want with whatever sort of depth you want, as long as it is projection mapped to look like a 3D space for that point of view specifically. We didn't mention that in Mandalorian. Those scenes, those those uh, those sets where they would have someone standing in front of an LED wall do not look like a real 3D environment when you're looking at it from any angle other than the cameras. So for all this stuff, too. And we've done this before. Like, what if the projector is sending lasers into the person's eyes and that makes them see what they need to see from that angle? But that's the important thing. But then it's not only you have to track not only every single eyeball, but every single camera. So once you get into the scale of operation like we have in this movie where there's hundreds or thousands of people around the London Bridge watching the monster fight Spider-Man, that's too much for that to work. Stark tech. And that's have, why it's, it's got to be tech. some kind of different hologram or holography. In fact, the point of Jake Gyllenhaal's gambit, his whole ruse was just to steal Tony Stark's glasses from Spider-Man. Or not even steal, like grift Tony Stark's glasses from Spider-Man. The smart glasses that are the access, the one and only control for, it seems, all of Tony Stark's crazy technology in space and all that. Like all the drones and the satellites and an entire defense network at his disposal, 16 years old, in the glasses. And Spider-Man gave uh, Jake Gyllenhaal Root, and it turns out he was the bad guy. I don't know. It seems closer to Pseudo Demetrius than Root. Or another administrative account. Pseudo make me a superhero? Pseudo give me all the drones. This activity will be reported? This is timely enough. This is a cool thing that I don't know if we talked. Have we talked about this on the show? I'm not Pseudo sure. Pseudo or auditing? No, definitely. Both of those things because... probably weren't in the show. <laughs> but I mean, smart glasses. <laughs> I'm not sure we have. And there's recent news in this area where Amazon seems to be offering. Uh, they took pre-orders and it's not out yet, but offering what looks like probably pretty good smart glasses for the first time. There was a real hiccup on the whole smart glasses thing. 
when Google Glass happened and failed? Like, there's two directions to be considered. There's the outward-facing technology of, like, the Snap Spectacles or whatever, uh, or the Google Glass, which was which didn't work at all, versus something like this, which is an internally-facing system of, I talk to my personal assistant, and it just happens to be on my face. The form factor of the glasses isn't the important thing. It's just the ubiquity of them on your face that you can have very subtle interactions with your personal assistant without the world having to watch you talk to your phone or your headphones or something. And I think this is going to be a big deal. And all of the options that I've been able to find thus far of smart glasses besides this Amazon one were like not great, like really not great. Big and clunky or ugly was the general theme. This doesn't even have to be a very complex thing at all. Like legit, I need bone conducting headphones that are glasses, which also have a microphone so I could talk to my phone because I want my phone to be the hub. I'm not sure why it took this long, but it's the first good looking ones I'm seeing are the Echo Glass. But one of the one of the key differences I guess you should point out between what the Google Glasses was trying to do and these is the Echo Frames don't really offer any visual AR component. There's no augmented. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the other I get you're right. It's not just the cameras taking in information, but in the case of Google Glass, it was also able to have a small display, a small crystal display that would be your text messages or directions or whatever. And It seems like we're not going in that direction anymore. All the interesting products that were being developed in that area have fizzled out or gone away, unfortunately. Maybe unfortunately. I don't know. I'm holding a hope for the Magic Leap. Yeah, yeah. Magic Leap is a whole other category that I hope works out. Your nerd goggles? I would not wear the ones that exist, I don't think. Yeah, you would. I I mean, if you gave them to me, yeah, I would wear them. But – that that's you can see that that's not going to be acceptable like you can't walk around all day and be a normal person with that on your face uh sure you could and be a normal person when you're out and about how often do you interact with anyone me yeah personally yes like never (laughs) so there you go (laughs) i tried you've you've not only enhanced your experience you've discouraged people (laughs) actively discouraging them from interacting with you this might be the right idea this might be exactly what I need then. How much is the Magic Leap now? Uh, it's a lot. I think it was like 2400 Oof. Oof. That's a lot. That is a lot. Okay, maybe I don't need those. Yeah, I think I, I consider those closer to VR on the spectrum, augmented reality, than it is to the function of where glasses, where smart glasses seem to be going, which is not to display information any longer. I'm not sure why those went away. I would say it's still augmented reality. It's just... All it's oral it is to be augmented oral, oral augmented reality, AAR. I don't think anyone's calling it that, and it sounds bad, but uh, but having it be talking to you in your ear in a way that is not obvious, too. That's the thing about the smart glasses, it's appealing is you can just wear normal glasses as far as anyone can tell. Meanwhile, you're communicating with your uh, Scarlett Johansson phone, and so now I guess now that you pointed out the, the magic leap, maybe there's three directions to look there's the AR goggles, which are still really far away from being a real thing for anyone, it feels like, and are very expensive. There's the Google Glass or that Intel set that didn't work out either, where it's we're going to have a display on your glasses that you could see. Kind of a portion that's not there. It seems like we've settled on the direction and it's audio in your ears. because And it makes sense. It's like, it's really affordable. You know, bone conduction headphones are not that expensive to produce, ultimately. It's that and a microphone and you have the entire thing with the battery. There are details to be worked out, but there's a lot fewer details than there are to make the Magic Leap a product that people are going to be wearing on their face all day. And I like that. The thing I don't like is that the best looking product of the bunch, although it's not actually on the market yet, is from Amazon because I'm starting to get nervous about their plan to put the microphones in all the things. Microphones and cameras. Microphones and cameras. Mostly microphones, which is totally enough. Like, and I have an, uh, what do we call it? I have one of the, the, uh, on, you got, there's a camera in your phone, in your TV, in your doorbell. Potentially, yes. And the speakers are in your house, pro- probably. Mm-hmm. I guess you got the fancier versions. As much as I'm, I love where this personal assistant stuff could go with the ubiquity of microphones, with the ubiquity of an ability to communicate with your assistant wherever you are and whatever you're doing. I don't love that one company is owning it all, uh, and considering who they are, no less. I would like a freer version of this, please. They just want to have the microphones and all the things now. That's it. It's probably a good plan because they're offering a lot of convenience with these things, unfortunately. And soon they'll take over the world. Probably. Like people are going to keep buying them. 
I, I'd be, I'm even buying some of them as much as I don't like what's happening. Although I've, I haven't had the greatest experiences with bone conduction. Yeah, you had a pair and I've used it before and it was kind of cool. It is. It's just the thing is that they allow a noise to go through your ears. Which is the point. However, now you have competing sound sources. And it, yeah, so if you need to and actually it's hear still, the thing. It's just the amount of energy. You either have to increase the the energy it's pumping into you to hear better. And now it's just louder. You don't get the sound isolation right. from actually clogging and blocking your ear canals. And so the bone conduction is really a central technology. The bone conduction audio is a central technology to making the ubiquitous but invisible personal assistant on your face work. So I don't know if we talked about it, but how does that work? It's actually really straightforward. There's not much here. Yeah. It literally is conducting sound across your bones. Yep. <laughs> Just put a speaker, gets your draw. It's like putting you – like it. <laughs> No, really, that's that's all they are, pretty much. It's slightly modified, but it's just a speaker. But that means it's essentially, if it's done correctly, it's essentially silent to the people around you while you can hear the thing. And you don't have headphones in. You can act like a normal person while dealing with your thing. That's pretty sweet. Or you can listen to podcasts at a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> that was my idea, was to have them at work so I could listen to music and just carry on with my day without it actually stopping me from hearing anything. Turns out that the office is a noisy environment. And then mm. you just wind up listening to the thing louder, and it still kind of gets in a way. The quality of bone conduction, though, is the least of his problems with the uh, with the Tony Stark glasses. Like, there's way more going on, but that's that's the nature of the Stark technology, which is just like the the trump card for everything. Sure. It's a get out of jail free card. And actually, all the the individual pieces of those technologies, like I get, I've touched those and dealt with those enough that it's like it, it, we put them together and made them better. But like all that makes sense. The thing that was way more out there was maybe like his his 3D Spider-Man suit printer on his magic jet that goes to space. All of it's a little bonkers. Nanotechnology. Why would he do anything that isn't nano once he has nano stuff? Like legit, tell the nanobots to build a nanobot maker bot, and then you could make a bunch more nanobots. Try not to gray goo the whole place, but like you could do whatever you want once you have the nanotech, right? Maybe he's just working with what he knows. Like, I don't want to mess with that right now. We'll make a thing I am comfortable with, which is clothes. And fabric. <laughs> clothes and not <laughs> potential world ending technology. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess that might be uh you you would want to take the time to consider the uh implications of that one. Because then why wouldn't he just have a vat of nanotech? That's just a good any, question, Colbert. everywhere. Yeah. Tony. Why didn't Tony? We, I think we talked about that. Is he should have been eighty percent nan uh nanites. Like you don't need skin. You don't need bones. No. You don't need muscles. I got nano. <laughs> I got bots. Bots for days. Look, it's 600 pound uh, Tony Stark over there. <laughs> <laughs> and Happy Anne and May are having a relationship and it's cute. And Spider-Man beats Jake Gyllenhaal, who turns out to be a bad guy. But, but, this is the big thing at the end. His identity is revealed. Uh, Mysterio gets one last, one last bad guy move post-mortem. Is to reveal Spider-Man's identity. And that's the end. And I guess that's uh, set us up for the next movie. Cool. What did we learn? I learned about Venice. And I was really surprised. I don't know, surprised. I just had no idea, like, how did that get there? And it turns out they got there by putting a whole forest under it. That was actually the trick. Let's bury an entire forest straight up and down to hold us up against the clay. Not bedrock, but clay. And eventually we'll sink. But we'll get like a couple thousand years maybe if we're lucky. Pretty sure that wasn't in their plan when they did it. How far ahead do you think they were thinking? Probably not thousands of years. <laughs> it's working out. Like, they're getting close. They might not make it at this rate, but it's only because we're raising the sea level artificially. This was a fun Spider-Man movie. I'm really digging this Spider-Man. As much as Spider-Man 2 in particular was one of the best comic movies that ever happened still, uh, the Raimi, Raimi style, I'm digging Tom Holland a lot. He's a really charming... Apparently not actually a child, but totally sells it as a 16-year-old. He's very good. It's because you're old now. And recommended related stuff. Uh, I did mention earlier the Tom Scott video where he does a better, more honest job of explaining what a VPN would do for you and how it would work. So I'll put it in the show notes. What about Into the Spider-Verse? You know what? That was an excellent Spider-Man movie. I forgot. I was talking about Tobey Maguire. I didn't consider that off the top of my head because it's not live action as well. I feel like it should be a different category or something, but that was a really, really great Spider-Man movie. And we had a really fun episode with Adrian Falcone where we talked about like physics and stuff. He talked about physics and stuff where we're like, duh. 
That was thecyberside.com slash 206. And I'll also recommend supporting your creators online to make the stuff you like. And here is a love letter to the people who are supporting us making our things. They're Joe Ferraro, Robert the Roaster, Lucas the Blazing Firework, Alan Michael Poles, Venetian Doge Superman, because Doge is a word other than dog, it turns out, from history. Dean and LSG Media, Andy P. Bash 25 Comics, Terrence Lee, Sapphire Interfaces Enthusiast Hugh Fisher, Petrified Tree Nipples Chris Kennard, because it's rock hard, uh, Brian the Sexiest Brother Peterson, Andrew Capitulo the Mighty, Jeff Ryan Schwartman, Michael the Giantess Peterson, Samuel Mumby, Igor Smolinski, Josh FNG of LSG Media, Mr. Raygun Curly Phil, Tema Sikama His Arms Wide, John Dwares, Venetian Gelato, Matt Greek, Gino Lomolino, Adrian Mihaly, Dinosaur Hunter, Arcobi FF Joe Ruppel, Scotty M. Scotty doesn't know. Scotty doesn't know how VPNs work. Also, Elad Avron, The Star Lord Adam Piper, Jeremy the Top Poster, Carmelita Valdez McCoy, Donnie Migliori, Buggy Deer Luke Bailey, Alaric Durkin, Gun Arm Superhero, Daniel James Barker of Uncertainty Principle, of the podcast, Adrian Falcone of this podcast sometimes, like the Spider Verse episode. John, champion of shape-shifting squirrel beavers. DJ, tiny Peter Tingle Moffat. He's got a tiny Peter Tingle. Is it just far away? <laughs> and my mom and Grandma Judy. And magical flying night monkey unicorn Jolene Creighton. The night monkey? Yeah, that's what it said on the news, and the news never lies. Thank you, everybody, for helping us make our stuff. Decipher sci-fi and decipher history. Everybody else, please consider supporting your creators. And if we're the thing you'd like to support, you can go to cyphermedia.tv slash support the show to support the shows. You can also help support the show by recommending us to others. Send them to decyphermedia.tv where they can listen to either of our our wonderful shows. (laughs) Wonderful. We got to get back to a decipher history. It's been a minute. That one, like one of these shows is coming out every week, but we haven't committed to a regular release on Decipher History. So it's whenever we get to it. They are a lot more work, it turns out. What do you think is next? Alexander? Probably. We're primed up, but we lost our uh, we lost our guest for that one. That didn't work out. If anybody wants to connect us with their own favorite uh, Ancient Greece History podcaster person, please let us know. I just got to work on getting your Peter Tangle back. It's my blip beard. Because I grew it in the blip. Do they have bananas in Venice? Probably not a gross Michael. Gro Michelle? Gro Michelle. Whatever. Gross Michael. <laughs> they don't have gross Michael bananas, Chris. <laughs> I'm not going to buy that. <laughs> Who named this? <laughs>